we are coming to you from our nation's capital. I'm Dennis Garris. I'm the partner in charge of our Washington office. And you are in our situation room for a federal update. We are thrilled to have Carolyn Smith, a 20-year veteran of the Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation, and the Honorable Earl Pomeroy, a nine-term member of Congress. Both Carolyn and Earl are in our public policy shop in the D.C. office, so let's get started with our federal update. There's a lot of crazy in Washington, and the new Congress is well underway. Earl, is there anything happening? <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot happening. Uh, not a lot getting done, but a lot happening. And let's begin with the constitutional crisis that's kind of playing out in front of us. you got to go to Anyone that's ever had Con Law 101 has got to love this. Really, it's square before the public is the relative spheres of power between the executive branch, the legislative branch, ultimately the judicial branch. Yesterday on the floor of the Senate, uh, no fewer than 12 of the president's own party left on a vote relative to whether the president had emergency powers to take the spending bill and rearrange it pushing more money into building the wall than the congressional negotiators had agreed upon and the president had signed into law just a few weeks ago. Uh, I really think that this is an extraordinary uh, and interesting time. And one of the things about divided government coming out of the 2018 elections, you're having a, a, a president that's forward-leaning in terms of the reach of the executive branch versus, a, in particular, a Democratic House who wants to say, whoa, and pull back that realm of responsibility. Uh, it looks like the uh, nullification bill will now go to the president. He will veto it. He's not going to sign anything that limits his powers. Uh, Congress will try to override. It does not look good relative to override. Uh, at that point, the third branch of government comes in. Judiciary ultimately determines this one. Carolyn? Anything to add on that? Uh, no, I just want to say I think that really is from the from when this president took for first took over in the White House. He indicated that um, he was going to stretch uh, the limits of, um, or the lack of limits as he saw it of his power. And I think this latest um, uh, incident in the National Declaration uh, is really um, moving along that line. Okay. So, so, Earl, as you know, we're in a time of divided government. Many would say that that's uh, a healthy thing for our country, but uh, what would you describe as the principal goals of the House and Senate during these times? Well, I, I really do think that for the session, the principal goal of the House uh, reflects uh, trying to reestablish the legislative branch as the policymaking branch of government, reining in some uh, the executive branch powers, but providing a, a substantial oversight on what's going on with the executive branch. Uh, you will have no fewer than uh, three formal oversight committees working along, and I expect a, a, a number of other committees to join in the oversight effort. The president will uh, clearly claim that there's overreach going on, that they're trying to nullify the election and a rush to impeachment. Uh, this week, the Speaker of the House said impeachment is not in the cards and seems to advance basically a three-pronged test relative to impeachment. First, were there crimes committed? Second, were the crimes of a nature, high crimes and misdemeanors of a threshold for impeachment? But adding a third, a third certainly not found, the last impeachment go around relative to President Clinton, is there bipartisan support to have a resolution move forward ultimately with the prospect of conviction in the Senate? Uh, without those three elements, I don't think this oversight activity will be about impeachment. I think the oversight activity is about bringing uh, uh, accountability to the executive branch. Now, on the Senate side, you've got another exercise of jurisdiction and authority relative to uh, their powers, and it's we want to make certain this Republican-dominated Senate uh, facilitates the president's appointments of judges to the fullest expen extent possible. Just think about this one. When it comes to uh, circuit appeals judges, Last two years of President Obama, two appointed. First two years of President Trump, 30 appointed. Supreme Court justices, last two years of President Obama, zero. You all remember, of course, Merrick Garland holding out there forever without even getting a hearing. Uh, first two years of President Trump, two Supreme Court justices. 
One analysis now has 20% of the circuit court level appealed by uh, 20% of the circuit court judges nominated by President Trump. Uh, as if this was not, it, it is, by the way, a historic rate of accomplishment relative to filling the judges. They want to accelerate it by changing the rules of debate. Right now, each one gets 30 hours of debate on the House floor. I think you can look for rules changes, bringing that down to two hours. Clearly, President, uh, the Ma Majority Leader McConnell has got a laser focus on getting that bench filled in uh, as completely as possible with Trump-appointed judges, and that's well underway. So, so Carolyn, tell us, in this context, how does – how does Congress go about getting their business done? Do they? Do they? Well, yeah, they're going to try. There is real business to do. Um, one of the things about process is, well, as Earl mentioned, the Senate and Leader McConnell is focused on nominations. That means in the Senate it places a lot more priority on the committees um, doing their business, looking for whatever the committees are, looking at the issues within their jurisdiction, and trying to move things along so that if and when there's an appropriate time, there is legislation ready. Uh, on the House side, we're going to see a lot more as what people call a return to at least some semblance of regular order, including more hearings on issues as well as um, committee action on things before anything moves to the floor. Um, and there are two main reasons the House are doing this, and they've embodied some new policies um, in their House rules this time. And one is their reaction to what they viewed as a Republican Congress, particularly like with the tax cut bill, where they just move very quickly, uh, you know, outside of the normal process. And they didn't like that approach. They want to take a more deliberate process. The other thing is with so many new members in the House, it gives much more opportunity um, both to include new members and issues that are new to them and include them in the process as well as educate uh, those new members uh, as, as to their job. So that's in terms of process. Uh, in terms of we do have some specific deadlines and drivers of legislation that regardless of what else happens, we will know that we will have some legislation this year. Um, and so what are those two things? The first is uh, September 30th, which is the end of this fiscal year, and we just had a big shutdown and a big battle over the wall and all that funding crisis, and Congress and the President eventually worked it out, but that funding only lasts until the end of this year, uh, fiscal year, which is September 30th. So Congress needs to go through all that again and focus on spending caps and work through appropriations and whatever isn't done and whatever funding is not in place, if there's no permanent funding for the entire government, they either need to do a continuing resolution by September 30th um, or uh, we have another shutdown. So there, that's a must-do. The other thing that's driving a must-act legislation is the debt limit. And the amount of debt that the U.S. government can issue is limited by statute. And the statutory limit on the debt expired on March 1. That doesn't mean we're in default yet. Um, Treasury has what they call extraordinary measures and what I call the uh, ordinary or usual extraordinary measures because they do this all the time. They sort of stop making payments here or jigger things around within the budget. So we're not really at default yet. When that time comes, is subject to estimate. Um, the Congressional Budget Office so far says, well, we think that, that that point will really be later in September this year, maybe early October. Hmm, gee, kind of corresponding with the spending bill. So we may be looking towards, in terms of process and actual legislation, uh, quite a few months this year. And whenever you have a big spending bill or something like that in the past, we've seen that can be an opportunity for all kinds of other pieces of legislation to go along with it. So. Earl, let's talk health care. We see a lot um, being discussed in the papers. What's going on uh, with health care? Well, health care has dominated the congressional uh, agenda for some time. Uh, and I think you are looking at a session that's got the follow-up on uh, the repeal and replace measures, uh, moving to, which, to great disappointment of the President and the Senate House majorities, failed by a John McCain's famous no vote uh, last Congress, moving into with divided government, nothing quite so uh, so big and bold as that frontal assault uh, on Obamacare. But it isn't to say that things aren't going on. Uh, if you think, you know, that puzzle game where you pull out the block until the thing falls over, uh, that is really what's at stake, trying to change the architecture of Obamacare in meaningful ways, uh, beginning with the tax bill, which repealed the individual mandate. The whole thrust of the individual mandate was to get a number of uh, people into the pool, uh, younger, healthier lives, broad risk pools. Uh, basically, uh, after the tax bill, you decide what you want to do relative to whether or not you have health insurance. Additionally, uh, association health plans, 
short term durational plans these innovations advanced by the administration and now accompanied by health reimbursement account activity all go to the notion of restoring in the private sector medically underwritten coverage alternatives that for those that are healthy and will be able to obtain coverage it's going to be cheap to be cheaper than the non subsidized premium offered on the exchanges on the other hand the whole point of Affordable Care Act reforms was to make sure that people who couldn't pass the medical underwriting screens had coverage opportunities many of you might have noticed those commercials from last fall about pre-existing medical condition protection the public overwhelmingly likes that part of federal law so you're going to see some ongoing tension about trying to restore medical underwriting to allow private sector to get lower price products out there but the pushback by the public that likes those kinds of protections clearly though that is the number one thing that's going to be in health care and maybe even has a prospect for some bipartisan achievement is prescription drug costs 80 percent of the public think drug prices are too high kind of makes you wonder what country the other 20 percent are living in they and there's hearings and bipartisan activity Senate side house side relative to prescription drugs are there areas emerging where the parties look like they can agree well not clearly yet although here's where I expected maybe some action trying to take trying to whatever it needs to be done relative to getting product to market generic product to market more quickly by a similar products to market more quickly to provide a competitive alternative to the expense of name brand products think you'll see some push there I think you have another realm of agreement possible relative to looking at patent law and whether or not pay for delay activities of the industry exploitation of patent protections from competition have been unfairly used in ways that do not advance health policy but stymie the market from competitively priced products maybe there's some room for activity there still in the end I think you're going to have pretty sharp differences about bolder measures probably have this setting up as a big 2020 election one of the things that's received in the in the nature of 2020 election topics Medicare for all single payer you're seeing a new and lively group on the left fringe of the Democratic Party in the House as well as Bernie Sanders of course carrying this bill on the Senate side and and with plenty of by plenty of co-sponsorship both House and Senate this gonna even go anywhere this session no the key committee chairman of jurisdiction this week said no hearings on Medicare for all frankly the Democrats don't even want to talk about it most of them and I don't think you're going to see even the beginning stirring of legislative activity this is going to be something for the 2020 election great so let's uh, let's talk taxes Carolyn the uh, Republican controlled Congress uh, as you know passed the the Tax Cuts and Job Act uh, included some big corporate rate cuts and and some temporary individual tax cuts uh, and a lot of other things that people can't understand. So uh, what's uh, what's the tax outlook now? Uh, well, the tax outlook for me personally is my, my return is not quite done yet. But, um, <laughs> and I did adjust my withholding. Um, so before we get to that, there's a little bit of unfinished business in the tax world, and that is a whole bunch of tax extenders, 26 that expired actually at the end of 2017, so and three that expired at the end of 2018. And um, this is kind of old and cold business. There was uh, some hope that it would be resolved in the spending legislation and right along with it. Obviously, that did not happen. Um, so there is some interest in trying to get that done. Uh, some of those extended uh, were well into the individual filing season right now, and the corporate uh, deadlines are not far behind. So uh, unclear if something will be able to get done on that or not. But we have seen some progress made in the Senate. Uh, Chairman Finance Committee Chairman Grassley and Ranking Member Wyden introduced a bipartisan bill to at least deal with those older expired ones and extend them to the end of this year. Um, in 2019 um, and then um, the House Ways and Means Committee has started uh, their look at it which means that they've had hearings on uh, ex expiring tax policy um, so that even if these were to get done soon we've got a bunch of things that expire at the end of this year we've got a bunch of health taxes that come back into effect are going to affect and a lot of other things but that is at least one piece of business that is sort of underway um, as far as the Tax Cuts and Job Act, um, really the eyes are all on the Ways and Means Committee in the House. Um, 
uh, because, uh, first of all, uh, we're not seeing a bill to immediately up that 20, 21% corporate tax rate, although over time I think a general sense is that will not be sustainable, but it's not as if their first business of the day is, yeah, hey, yeah, let's just, let's just raise that. Um, in terms of fixing or technical corrections to the, to the, to the bill, um, the approach of the new, the new majority is they were not involved in that process, and so their approach is not going to be, oh, yes, this is what was intended, we're going to fix it to be what was intended. Um, they're going to look at it and say what's working, what doesn't work. Um, some provisions, for example, in the international area getting a lot of attention that may not work uh, as folks would like to from a policy perspective uh, in terms of uh, maybe some perverse things of having an interest to set, send more, uh, you know, in income overseas, which was not the opposite of, of what people were trying to do. I think they'll also really look at some of the priorities and uh, the middle income taxpayers, you know, can we do something more for them? And so I think they will look at it, and there may be some opportunity for change. It's going to take a while to work through that process, and we'll see more hearings and some proposals. Um, uh, but that is definitely something that will be looked at. On the Senate side, I think, you know, well, there may be some changes there. Obviously, Chairman Grassley is going to have an interest in protecting um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So we need to wrap up. Um, if you could both uh, spend a minute on, um, on what folks should be doing who uh, would like to see some legislative changes. Well, I'd say as we're talking about here, it's really hard to have a crystal ball, and even the leaders of the Congress don't really know how it's going to go. Um, but the fact of the matter is, just kind of like Mitch McConnell tells to his committee chairman, you need to do your work and you need to get ready. And so if people are interested in changes, I would say, you know, don't wait until you think something's moving because it's a little bit too late. But, you know, uh, you know, try to get the work done and talk about it. Uh, let people know what your, what your interests are. Otherwise, when the time comes, you know, the boat, the boat will be full. Every day we're on the Hill or working with legislative offices trying to find uh, vehicles to move ideas forward. In the end, uh, the needs of our clients don't fall into Republican or Democrat categories. They're legitimate needs of our corporate clients, and we try to move them forward. It involves a lot of shoe leather and education into the member offices, uh, all the while looking there will be legislative activity this Congress, believe it or not, uh, and we want to make certain that the needs of our clients have been fully explained, the proposals to advance their goals clearly put forward, uh, and we want to get in the packages that move. They're not going to be a lot moving, but the ones that move are going to be big, and we want to be in there. That's our work for the rest of the session. Okay, well, great. That is the federal update from Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.